Kiksukukik, who got like Amber Louie, who Nini Tanaha, Wishka Wu'u, who got Gaki Yakanuki, and who Kasakani was saying it. So, good morning. I'm Amber Louie. I'm of Tanaha Nation ancestry, and my ancestors come, ac come from across the big water, as I've been instructed to say from my Tanaha Nation. And currently, I am in with the Wasainich territories, and I am presenting on undoing and unlearning white supremacy, indigenous specific racism. In the British Columbia Office of the Provincial Health Officer, my focus was on a review of the medical health officer standards. By acknowledgement, I respectfully acknowledge the territories of the Lukwungam peoples and the Songhees, Esquamod, and Wasainish peoples whose unceded land I live on. And I acknowledge the territory of the Tanaha Nation, whose nation I am a member of. And I'm grateful for the wisdom, guidance, and support from Dr. Danielle Bain Smith and Dr. Kate Youngblood. So this slide is from the Unlearning and Undoing Club, which starts each gathering to ground us in the inherent rights of Indigenous people. This is what we were doing in our project. First Nations territory stretched to every inch of this province. Inherent rights rooted in connection to lands and waters have never been ceded or surrendered. Inherent rights are upheld in international, national, and provincial law. And longstanding Indigenous laws and systems are integrally tied to the lands and waters of these territories. And there's generations of Indigenous rights holders who are First Nations, Métis, and Inuit from elsewhere in Canada who also call these lands and waters home. So the BC Office of the PHO is doing this Unlearning and Undoing White Supremacy Project, and it's a two-year research initiative. I joined in year two of this project, and my practicum project focused on reviewing the medical health officer standards. And policies have been developed and implemented without adequate input from Indigenous communities, which has produced historical and ongoing harmful impact on Indigenous peoples in Canada. So this is their project project vision and what they're working towards. So they're unlearning inherited and systemic white supremacist ways of thinking to become meaning, meaningful, <laughs> inclusive of diverse worldviews, perspectives and approaches. And they're undoing inherited systemic white supremacist approaches that are hardwired into the structures, policies, practices, norms and values within the OPHO and the whole health system. So tools that unlearning and undoing research initiative is using fall in these four categories, which is unlearning, monitoring, undoing, and hardwiring. And my project fits there in the undoing, which is a policy and process review. The approach they're using comes from Dr. Kamara Jones' science and practice of anti-racism, which has three tasks, naming racism and white supremacy, asking how are racism and white supremacy operating in our sphere of influence, and organizing and strategizing to act. We also are using Jody wilson Raybelt's three tasks of which came out with their true reconciliation, which is learn, understand, and act. So the first task is naming racism and white supremacy and learning. So learn and name. We're gonna learn and name the ways in which settler colonialism, racism, and white supremacy have shown up and continue to show up in the MHO standards. So this requires truth before reconciliation. So the history of MHOs and indigenous populations. Worldviews, where do our worldviews come from and whose worldviews are used in the MHO standards? This is learning and naming knowledge, includes mainstream evidence, excludes indigenous evidence. And learning and naming power, are the inherent rights of indigenous people recognized? So the Provincial Health Officer Standards of Practice was last updated on August 16, 2017. So the medical health officers, they have diverse responsibilities, including advising the government, they manage public health, and they communicate with the public. They influence policy development. And in addition to their duties to report disease, they actually have been granted wide powers, the most important of which are the powers to examine, enter, detain, isolate, and close places and their power carries a risk of discriminatory application. So the second task now is asking how are racism and white supremacy operating in our sphere of influence and understand. So we are asking ourselves to understand the commitments that have already been given in relation to that topic, which is the MHO standards, and to understand ourselves in relation to that topic. So this includes the United Nations declarations on the rights of indigenous peoples, the murdered and missing indigenous women and girls. We have BC DRIPA, Truth and Reconciliation Commission. You have the in-plain sight report and the BC Cultural Safety and Humility Standard. <laughs> 
Keep in mind, we have provincial, federal, and international laws about the inherent rights of Indigenous people through Section 35 of the Canadian Constitution, court rulings, treaties, and the adoption of UNDRIP into federal and provincial law. So my approach, I reviewed the MHO standards with the TRC, MMIWG, BC DRIPA, In Plain Sight, UNDRIP, and the BC Cultural Safety Humility Standards and through the lens of Indigenous rights through Section 35 treaties and court decisions. So these are some of the relevant recommendations for MHO standards that can be used to uphold Indigenous rights. I don't have time to go through which ones it is, but the In Plain Sight has 16 recommendations. UNDRIP has 10 that can be included. MMIWG has 13, BC DRIP and Action Plan has nine recommendations, TRC has six recommendations, and BC Culture and Safety Humility Standards has 92. The third uh, task now is organizing and strategizing to act and act. So we're gonna act in naming specific anti-racist actions we can take to uphold the inherent rights of indigenous peoples. So we can act within our spheres of influence. This requires a personal journey of unlearning and read the reports and how do you uphold these recommendations in your work? <clears throat> so reviewing the MHO standards using name, learn, understand and act requires indigenous knowledge and indigenous knowledge cannot be fragmented. It is interdependent upon relationships with the land, water, people, ourselves, cosmos and resources. And this work requires an indigenous relational approach because it involves the experiences, actions and relationships. So these are some of the questions that were used to guide my review, which is, do these standards include mainstream evidence over indigenous evidence? This is your worldviews, your perceptions of indigenous knowledge. What power do MHOs have and where does it come from? Were indigenous voices meaningfully involved? Do these standards uphold indigenous rights? And does this policy require non-indigenous agreement to be implemented? And is the mechanism for shared decision-making with indigenous people clearly articulated? So how white supremacy is upheld on the MHO standards? If you recall, the most current ones are from 2017. Keep in mind, this was written after the development of the Douglas Treaties here in BC, after the Niska Treaty in 2000, Section 35 of the Constitution Act that upholds Indigenous rights to self-determination. It's written after the Royal Commission of Aboriginal Peoples, after the Mikaso decision um, about Aboriginal rights on reserve, after the Chilcotin a uh, Chilcotin decision in 2014 that said we had rights off the reserve. It's after UNDRIP in Canada officially endorsed that in 2016 and it's after the TRC recommendations. Indigenous peoples have the right to make decisions about things that affect them. It is important to consider self-determination in the development of the policy as well as self-determination in the activation of policy. These rights are not upheld in the MHO standards. The knowledge used for these standards excludes Indigenous knowledge. MHO power is upheld from the Order and Council, and there is a complex power relationship right now with the First Nations Health Authority MHOs and Order and Council. And Indigenous populations are only mentioned twice in MHO standards. First, as Aboriginal leaders and community partners, and this is in, re in regard to MHO roles and responsibilities in their section six of communication, collaboration, and advocacy for the public health. And they're mentioned in section eight in the professional practice area. The results expected of MHOs are aspects of the tripartite First Nations health plan to which medical officers can contribute. There are no accountability or evaluation plans for MHOs contributions to the First Nations health plan. So moving forward, this work requires every staff member, leader, and team in public health systems across Canada to uphold legal commitments to First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples. And we are asking individuals to take a lifelong journey of addressing and eradicating white supremacy. And we have shared the ways in which each person has responsibility to this and how they can approach white supremacy through learn, name, understand, and act. Taha.